and welcome to this review of my SteelSeries Apex M800 keyboard. I got this keyboard in years ago when I was still living in the UK, but I never reviewed it. But I guess I've been doing reviews for so long now that keyboards that were brand new at the time are now actually kind of old. So this is going to be a kind of semi-retro review, which should be interesting. It's discontinued on SteelSeries' website, but still shows a price of $150, down from $200, which indicates that at the time it was actually quite a high-spec device. There are some interesting traits about this keyboard, including the fact that it's a battlecruiser format, albeit the smallest form of battlecruiser, and it has a switch type which I think was exclusive to this particular model of keyboard. These are QS1 switches, which we'll talk about later in the review. They're pretty funky. The keyboard itself is, well, <laughs> let's be honest, it's hideous! I like big form factors, they're very useful, and frankly it's a nice change from a 60% keyboard I'm testing simultaneously, but jumping Jesus Christ knitting a cardigan, this thing is quite the eyesore. Makes me think a bit of the old models of Razor Black Widow. Although I don't really have anything against big bezels, the shape of them here is quite ugly, and I really don't like the centered legends on the keys, or even the shape of the keycaps for that matter. I get why they did it, but it's still ugly in my opinion. Also, a special mention to the spacebar, which is just ridiculous. This might be the worst spacebar I've ever seen outside of an Ergo keyboard. <laughs> Other than that though, the keyboard, or rather the chassis, is fairly decent. It weighs about 1350 grams, or for those afflicted with Imperial units, 3.8652 tower pounds. It's pretty sturdy, with a little bit of flexion in the case, but not too much. And it comes with a tough braided cable with two USB pass-through ports available. These are getting a little bit rarer nowadays, but back in the day USB pass-throughs were kind of the norm for premium keyboards. Interestingly enough, despite having a pass-through cable, it's not too thick, nor is it all that unflexible. Many other models, like Corsairs for example, came with these massive, almost rebar-like cables, which were usually kind of difficult to keep around without creating a mess. The keycaps are simple, thin, laser-ablated ABS, very typical for this type of keyboard. They're rather low-profile because the switches are low-profile, and they also use a proprietary mount, which nowadays is kind of a faux pas, and one of the probable reasons that this keyboard eventually failed. The lettering is in the middle so that it lets the light through more evenly, which we'll get to in a bit. Not the best caps, but not the worst I've seen either. Something similar goes for the font, which isn't ugly, but neither is it good looking. Overall, the keycaps are about 3.6 run gun. It comes with an extra row of programmable dedicated macro keys on the left. I love macro keys, they're super useful, so this is nice to have, even though there's only six of them numbered 0 to 5. I wanted to look up how they worked by reading the manual, but the manual that's included is this pathetic piece of shit that shows virtually nothing. It's one of the weakest attempts at a manual I've ever seen, and I couldn't find the digital one at all, so that didn't really help. Eventually I found that it can be configured with SteelSeries' configuration tool called GG. I'm not sure if it was that originally as well, and I'm quite sure that this software is different from what it was like when this board was new. In fact, it even needed to install firmware updates on the keyboard itself. Anyway, the configuration tool is over 500 megabytes in size and you can't choose where to install it. Plus, at first it refused to install at all, or <laughs> even abort the installation, so that's a good start. The microprogramming is slightly weird, but it's not the worst I've ever seen. You start up the configuration tool, tell it to shove its SteelSeries account registration up its arse, launch the macro programmer from inside the configuration tool, and then you make a new macro and then later bind that macro to a key, rather than doing it the other way around. It's a little bit counterintuitive in my opinion, but again, I've had worse. It'd be good if there was an onboard programming function so you don't need the software, but if there is, I haven't discovered it because, again, there really isn't a manual. You can also use this program to configure the illumination, the thing this whole keyboard was clearly built around, but no matter what settings I pick and apply, it doesn't change anything, it just keeps it on the same settings. And this is really bizarre, it doesn't matter which I pick, it just always picks the same lighting. So, <laughs> and like I said, I mean, I am saving the settings as well whenever I can. 
but it just doesn't do anything. So yeah, that's its prime feature dashed to pieces right there. Finally, we get to the switches, which are the most interesting part in my opinion. These are QS1, which are a type of low-profile switch introduced in 2015, produced by Kai Hua for SteelSeries. They use a kind of sliding collar action, very reminiscent of Roma G switches, to which they were very clearly a response. This sort of center illuminated switch idea was kind of a short fad in the mid-2010s, I guess. To further capitalize on the RGB craze, they also added RGB side panels, by the way. Neither Roma G nor these QS1 switches really caught on, because apparently people did prefer keycap and plate mount compatibility over potentially better illumination in the end. A lesson many other companies have since taken to heart, even if you're making new switches, make them MX compatible, and preferably make them physically resemble MX switches as well, because anything else confuses and enrages keyboard enthusiasts. Making something new and interesting is fine and all, as long as it still looks like an MX ripoff. Still, this is one of the first of the, let's say, new wave of switch designs after the revival of mechanical keyboards around 2010. Nowadays we're getting some more forays into interesting non-MX territory as well, but this particular style of switch seems to have died out. Current variations are usually about using different materials, clicky and tactile elements, and actuation mechanisms instead, which is a bit more like it used to be in the olden days actually. Although of course the vast majority of new switches and modded switches are still just clones and part swaps of virtually identical MX type switches nowadays. The key feel is relatively bland, to be honest. The travel is only 3mm, but surprisingly doesn't feel all that obviously short travel, despite how I've been able to feel that much more explicitly on some other 3mm travel designs in the past. But that's okay, that's a compliment if anything. Smoothness-wise, it's really nothing special. Again, not bad, but nothing to write home about. If anything, it's a very banal feeling, light linear switch. To be honest, I like the waiting, and it's not that scratchy or something, plus it isn't overly sensitive. If anything, it's a bit of an all-rounder. I don't mind it at all. It doesn't really stand out, but not standing out in any negative way is a good thing too. It's fine, I guess. Now, of course, the whole point of this switch is to provide better illumination. That's why they put the light in the middle and built the rest of the switch around it to create a more even distribution of light, as MX top switches have to have the LED near one of the edges, which creates an uneven lighting pattern, particularly for secondary legends, as you can see here on this example. Like I said, Roma G switches were also based on this idea, except they use surface-mounted LEDs on the PCB and a light pipe to get it through the switch, whereas these ones use integrated LEDs in the switch itself. This is the easier way to do it, I guess. By the way, these Roma Gs lack the light pipe, and off the top of my head that's because this is a monochromatic model, and thus it doesn't really need light bundling. Now, you may be asking yourself, has it worked? And the answer is, not really, but it's maybe a tiny bit better. Instead of unevenness from top to bottom, here it's uneven from the inside out, and you can see on keys with more complicated legends that the edges are not really lit the same as they are in the middle. This sort of bad light diffusion is quite common and honestly not so easy to do well, as is the case here. Basically, the more away from the center the legend reaches, the uglier it looks. As for the quality of the RGB itself, that's okay. Again, I've seen better, but I've also seen worse. The light mixing isn't 100%, but it's better than many. That said, because I can't configure this keyboard to do anything interesting light-wise, I can't really give it a particularly in-depth review on this point either. Compared to the Roma G's on the Logitech that I reviewed ages ago, I'd say the Roma G actually lights its cap slightly more uniformly, but mainly because they crop their legends so badly that they don't stick out from the middle all that much, which is why they ended up with such a weird font. Because the Logitech uses a floating switch style of case and doesn't have low profile switches or caps like the Steel Series, it does have a lot more light bleed from under the keycaps, while the Steel Series uses an enclosed space which prevents this much more. You can still see a lot of light between the keycaps though. Perhaps the biggest advantage that this keyboard has is that they didn't try to copy Cherry MX Brown and just went for a linear switch, while Roma G did try that and ended up somehow feeling even worse, which is quite an achievement on its own. I think the Logitech is a lot better looking overall though. 
All in all, it's not a bad keyboard really, kind of ridiculous to ask 150 let alone $200 for it, but it's very noticeably a rather outdated product and pretty much an evolutionary dead end, really. It's okay, nothing hugely wrong with it, and the idea behind it is kind of cool, but in the end I guess it's a bit superficial, and it might have done better if it had had better compatibility or had more non-superficial features. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.